Thanks uh, for letting me give this talk. Uh, I'm Jonas, a postdoc at Michigan State University. Uh, and this is work I've been doing with uh, Chris Klausmeyer and uh, Tomako Fell, who is another postdoc uh, at Michigan State University. And uh, I'm interested in eco-evolutionary modeling and theory in the sort of general trait space. Uh, and if you like to base your ecological model on uh, on differential equations, I would say there are sort of two general bodies of theory that you can make use of. So the first of the first one is what I call like distribution and moment-based methods, where you have uh, where you track some distributions in trait space. You track a density distribution of the normals, uh, and you track the mean traits and the variances of these distributions. So these come in sort of all, all sorts of flavors. There's quantitative genetics. There's various community ecology approaches trait diffusion approaches, uh, what is known as oligomorphic dynamics, uh, where you have several species. And sort of the other sort of big tool in your toolbox uh, is uh, adaptive dynamics, uh, where we are not tracking entire distributions, but instead just describing each uh, species or ecotype by a single trait value. Uh, but the sort of the benefit of using adaptive dynamics is that you can track these evolutionary branchings, and you can use this for community assembly, as we have in this picture here. We, we can sort of, over time, uh, put together an eco-evolutionarily stable community. And this community is characterized by no further evolution happening, and it's also uninvasible to any other, uh, any other trait. So both of these uh, uh, frameworks have their benefits, uh, but they also have their drawbacks, uh, namely, so in the for the distribution and moment-based frameworks, we don't really have any good methods for community assembly. Uh, whereas in the adaptive dynamics case, we cannot track intraspecific variation, that there is no variance in these traits for each species or ecotype. All right, so why does this matter? Well, uh, for one, it would be nice to be able to assemble these communities while still keeping track of intraspecific variation if you're interested in intraspecific variation as a part of, say, ecosystem functioning. Uh, but a bit more specifically and relevant to this talk, it relates to local adaptation in structured populations. So here is sort of a, a very uh, basic sketch of a model. It's a reaction diffusion equation where we have a density U that grows locally in space that depends on some trait and where you are in space. And then there is some random uh, dispersal model by uh, diffusion. And if you do this with adaptive dynamics, you can certainly do it. Uh, you get some density distribution over space here on the left, and you get a trait, uh, but the trait must in adaptive dynamics necessarily be the same across uh, all of space. And to sort of understand uh, why this is so, we can do a thought experiment where we sort of try to have a trait uh, that varies over space. Uh, but what will happen now, thanks to the diffusion term, is that we will have larger traits coming in from the right and smaller traits coming in from the left. And the consequence of this is that we will get some intraspecific variation. And now we're sort of out of the realm of adaptive dynamics. Uh, converse, uh, so there is this sort of link between local adaptation and intraspecific variation. You need to sort of take both into account in some way. On the other hand, if you're doing one of these sort of moment-based approaches and you only start with one species, it might have turned out that this community might have actually been invasible by some different uh, species, or there might be an evolutionary branching, and the final thing you might end up with might look more like this, where you have much less local adaptation and much less uh, intraspecific variation in each species. So we have these sort of two different approaches where we have adaptive dynamics, which can detect the split into two species, but where you have no variation and no local adaptation. On the other hand, we have these moment-based methods, but we have no good tools there to detect this split into two species. So we need some, some way of combining uh, these, these methods in some way in order to be able to assemble communities and keep track of interspecific variation and local adaptation. And we have developed uh, just such a, a way of combining these things. Uh, and it's quite general, the thing we've developed. It can take care of multiple traits and various class-structured models, where a class-structured model is anything with discrete classes, such as spatial patches, uh, or, say, a stage-structured population with juveniles and adults. In this talk, though, I'm going to sort of try to frame this whole thing in terms of a toy model with a two-patch two example, though. So, 
uh, let's take a look at the, the basic setup of this of this two patch model. So the basic objects we're going to start by studying are these trait density distributions. We're going to have one trait density dis distribution on patch A and one on patch B, which are the figures you see uh, over on the right. And in principle, they, these could be of any shape. Uh, in addition to this, we're going to have two resources on each patch. So resource one and resource two on both patches. And our trait is going to parameterize a trade-off between your ability to take out resource one and resource two. And then we describe what happens to this uh, trait density distribution over time using a differential equation. Uh, so we're modeling the rate of change here on patch A uh, by first having a birth term that depends on the trait and the availability of resources. But these are then sort of filtered through a mutation kernel uh, with a variance uh, capital M so that we're always sort of generating a little bit of new uh, variety amongst the, the types over time. We then have some fixed background mortality, and then there is some fixed dispersal between the two patches. Similarly, for the for the resources, we have some local renewal on each patch chemostatically, and then we have some uptake function. So all the uh, sort of uh, all the guys here take up resources, and we have to integrate over the entire distribution. We then have a similar, uh, almost identical equations on, on the other patch. The problem with these equations is that they're very, very difficult to work with analytically and even numerically, especially if we go beyond this toy model, it's very challenging because you need to discretize trait space possibly quite finely in order to resolve all this. So we take a similar approach to many other of these models and uh, instead what we're going to do is that we're going to take this uh, trait density distribution that we have here and we're going to sort of assume that we can split it up into S uh, species or pseudo species, basically one for each peak. And then we're going to approximate these peaks uh, by normal distributions. So we're going to have a total density U, that is sort of that total area under each curve here. And we're going to have a mean chi for each peak. And we're going to have uh, some variance uh, for each peak. And this, uh, so in this example here, we will have two species. On, on two patches. And then uh, what we want to do uh, is that we want to introduce some notation for what happens on the population level. So the birth rate here is for a single trait value, and the hatted version here is for the entire population, the mean, psi, and uh, variance, B. And then we sort of try to derive differential equations for these three moments. So for the total density, it's pretty straightforward. We just compute the population level uh, uh, birth rate, and then we have the mortality rate and the dispersal. Uh, for the mean trait, uh, we get a directional selection term here. So it depends on the first derivative of this population level birth rate, which is sort of going to move the peak back and forth depending on, on selection multiplied by the variance. And then we have this mean trait flow between the two patches. So if the means are different between the patches, then we're going to have these peaks sort of pulling on each other to get closer to one another. And it's weighted by the relative densities across the patches. And then finally, we get an equation for the variance. And the first term here of the variance equation uh, is stabilizing or disruptive selection. So the second derivative of the birth term, if it's negative, is going to imply stabilizing selection, reducing variance over time. If it's positive, it's going to uh, increase variance over time. We then have uh, two terms coming from the dispersal here. So we have the variance flow, uh, which is similar to the mean trait flow. Basically, the, the variances are going to become more similar across the patches over time. And then we have this term that is sort of inter-patch to intra-patch uh, variation. And this is similar to the thing I showed you in the beginning. Basically, if the mean traits differ from patch to patch, that is going to generate variation within each patch. And then finally, we get a mutation term. So over time, mutation is going to generate new variation, which is increasing variance over time. And then we need to sort of adjust our resource equations a little bit. So we still get the same local renewal on each patch. And, but now we sort of need to calculate the population level uptake for each species and then some overall species. And then we'll get a very similar set of equations uh, for, for the other patch, which I'm, I'm not going to show here. So we have equations for tracking these equivolutionary dynamics for a given number of species now, if we assume S species. But the question is then, how do we determine how many species you need? 
And our approach to this is to try to sort of adapt the adaptive dynamics methods to this context where we now have intraspecific variation. And there are sort of two main tools in adaptive dynamics for doing these community assembly processes. Uh, and the first is uh, evolutionary branching. Uh, so the way uh, we're going to do this is that we're going to let a single resident community evolve to equilibrium. So the figures here, you can see a blue species, and we have density here on top, the mean trait on the bottom, and the area here depicts one standard deviation. So the sort of the blue species here evolves to some equilibrium on both patches, and it evolves an equilibrium in the traits and the variances as well. And once we've reached that, we sort of do a virtual thought experiment where we split these species and do a linear stability analysis. And if it turns out to be unstable, we know that we should be able to split the species uh, infinitesimally, and it will still sort of branch and we'll end up with a high trait variant and the low trait variant after uh, the branching. So that is the first tool. So the second tool we need from adaptive dynamics is, uh, or perhaps more invasion uh, analysis more generally, is some way of conducting an invasion analysis. So basically we want to tell, is a resident community invasible by any other uh, population? So the way we're going to do this is that for, for a resident community, we're going to introduce a very rare invader. And we assume that this invader will be so rare that it will not affect uh, the resident or any environmental uh, variables. And because the invader is very rare, we don't need to track its density, but we do still need to track its frequency across the two patches, which is what I'm going to denote by P here. So we can consider a resident community. Uh, that we have down here, where we see the, the frequency of the resonant on the y-axis and the mean trait uh, and one standard deviation once again uh, on the x-axis. So we have some resonant here. And what we do then is that we sort of run these invader equations while they're still considered infinitely rare and find the equilibria of the invaders. And if you do that, you will find that there is one invader equilibrium that I'm depicting here in green uh, with a low trait and one uh, invader depicted here in red uh, with a high trait. And once we have found these equilibria, we can calculate uh, the growth rate of each such invader using a formula with the right. Uh, and if this uh, growth rate or invasion fitness, if you like, is positive, that means that it will grow if we add it to the community of the resident. So what we will do is that we will add one of these invaders to the community, and then we will run sort of the same moment equations we had before, but now for two species. And after a while, we'll reach a new equilibrium uh, where we have uh, now a two species resident community. One uh, resident is in blue here and one is in orange. So we have a, a high trait resident and a low trait uh, resident. And then we sort of repeat this step of solving the invader equations again to find new invader equilibria. And if we do that, we will find this time around that the invaders will just mimic the resident distributions and consequently they will have an invasion fitness of zero. They are neutral because they're basically have the same distribution as the resonant. And once we find this, that we have no uh, invaders with positive invasion fitness, we say that our assembly process is complete and that we have reached an evolutionarily stable community. All right, so let's try to put this uh, combined approach uh, to the test. So it's specifically, we'd like to, to know two things in, in testing out this model. So first, how well does the moment equations uh, plus the assembly process replicate the trait space equations, which were sort of the more complicated equations we started with? So that's more of a technical question. But second, can we sort of use this modeling framework to capture this local adaptation, uh, which should arise when we have uh, interspecific variation mix? So a little bit more model details in order to be able to understand the results. So we're going to assume that we have different resource supplies on the two patches. So on patch A, we're going to have more resource one supply, and on patch B, we're going to have more uh, resource two supply. We have a type one functional response with affinities A1 and A2 for the respective resources that depend on the trait. And we're going to assume that there's a generalist favoring trade-off between these two affinities, A1 and A2. So when the trait is zero, you're a generalist, for negative traits, you're a resource two specialist. For positive traits, you're a resource one specialist. And because it is generalist favoring, uh, you get more total affinity when you're a generalist. 
So let us now look at some uh, results from this two-touch uh, model. So we have uh, a few panels here, so I'm going to go over them. So on the x-axis of each panel, we have the dispersal rate. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the mutation variance. So more mutation variance is going to generate more standing variation. And if the dispersal rate is very high, we have a well-mixed system. If it is low, very low, then the patches are basically uncoupled from one another. So let's first look at the number of species we get with these model equations. So we have, uh, as one might suspect, in a well-mixed system, we only get one species. And once dispersal rate gets sufficiently low, we get two species. The white vertical line here is the adaptive dynamics limit. So here is where you will get the transition using an adaptive dynamics model. And as we might suspect, for high dispersal rates, we get a, zero, a trait of zero, indicating a resource generalist. And then once we split into two species, we get that the patch one uh, trait will be positive, indicating resource one specialization. The standard deviation of variance, not surprisingly perhaps, increases with the mutational variance, but there's also a spike uh, around this transition from one to two species, essentially coming from deformations in the fitness landscape. And finally, we can sort of compare uh, the moment equations plus assembly method with the trade space equations and calculate sort of an error term. This is not super easy to interpret, but, uh, but we'll look at a few examples in a moment here. Uh, and uh, what I can say qualitatively is that apart from this region bounded by the solid black lines, we typically have very good agreement. And if we look at a transect here of this uh, horizontal line, uh, we can compare these sort of three different uh, quantities, the trait space equations here in dashed black, where we're tracking the locations of the peaks, adaptive dynamics, which is sort of the no variance uh, approach, and these moment equations. So the moment equations uh, actually track the trait space equations pretty well. And we can also see that we actually get some local adaptation here. So in the adaptive dynamics case, the trait is the same on both patches. But for the moment equations, we now have this sort of reversion towards the mean in the, in the off patches. So it seems that we can replicate the behavior of the trace space equations quite well and track the, uh, and track the local adaptation in the model. So we can also take a quick look at a couple of examples here of, of, of uh, what things look like uh, in this model. So let's first look at when things are not going so well with our approach. So when we're near this transition zone from one to two species, this, the trait space equations tend to assume quite strange shapes that are not very easy to capture with normals or in a combination of normals. Uh, and so typically we don't get very good agreement uh, in this transition zones. But outside of these transition zones, and now we're looking over here, uh, we typically get, get uh, the, the agreement is typically quite good. And the, perhaps even more surprisingly, if we turn up the mutation variance even further, and we will end up with something that looks like this. So in this case, the, the trait space equations depicted in green are actually unimodal, but highly not normal. But we can still capture sort of the general shape of this in using our moment equations plus assembly methods uh, by sort of combining these two species uh, normal uh, distributions to make up for this sort of odd, uh, odd shape. So uh, in summary, uh, we have devised this framework that we can, uh, where we can combine the intraspecific variation of moment methods with the community assembly uh, methods of adaptive dynamics. Uh, and at least for this two-patch model and other tests we've run, it seems to, to work out uh, very well in terms of replicating uh, the, the trait space equations. And by sort of using this approach, we can address uh, some problems that were previously, previously hard to address with modeling, uh, where we had things like simultaneous local adaptation and diversification uh, into multiple species. So with that, uh, I thank you very much. And for those who are interested, we have a, a preprint of a bioarchive if you would like to read up uh, more of this. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, do we have questions? Anyone online? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, one of the things that I've been struggling coming from a terrestrial modeling environment is what is the intuition of as 
uh, you, in this case, you're doing two patches, but the ocean is sort of three dimensional. And, you know, do you have any intuition of how we should be modeling the ocean differently than the typical ecological two patch terrestrial model that has come out of mathematical ecology? Yeah, so uh, although this is not part of the paper due to space constraints, you can very easily adapt all of these methods to, to, ver to various partial differential equations. So you could uh, track, uh, in instead of modeling two patches, you could have a, you could have basically, you could have continuous space instead and have some advection and diffusion terms uh, involved in the mix. Obviously it gets quite a bit uh, more computationally uh, adventurous at that point compared uh, to a two-patch model. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not an empirical sea uh, uh, guy, so I, I don't know a ton about how uh, how well uh, sort of the patched approaches might work to approximate uh, sort of different regions in the oceans. And well, based on the previous talks here, there seems to be some disagreement on this point whether we have like different distinct uh, regions in the oceans that could be usefully uh, patch approximated. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you can you can step up the, the the mathematical complexity and go over to partial differential equations modeling continuous space and still apply these uh, methods that we've we've developed. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So um, I had um, just a, a more of a technical question. So when you the results that you showed here. Um, uh, and, and maybe you already said it. What did you 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 said you this the sort of trait space and you know one zero was a generalist and one was a specialist whatever. Um, do, uh, what what did you choose for this example and and you know how how different would be the results as you went down across that that trait space. <laughs> Yeah, so, so let me see if I understand your question correctly. So, so basically, there, there is a trade-off, right? So, so uh, in principle, the, the trait at the final point in the simulation is given dynamically by, by the equations. So not picking out any traits in advance. They are sort of the traits we end up with in the end uh, are a combination of the ecological and evolutionary dynamics uh, acting uh, on the system. Uh, so I'm not sure I understood your question. Oh, oh, it was a misunderstanding on my part. Thank you. That explained it a bit more. So it's actually part of the whole the whole equations that you've got is is that that trait space. So great. Yes, exactly. So so, so the the traits are dynamic here. They are not fixed. Great, great. Thank you. Show even more utility in in the framework. Anyone else? And I don't see anyone online. In which case, let's, let's thank Jonas again very much for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you.